Hi, I'm Constantin. Have you ever wondered, what is a cardinality of a type? Or how does one focus on an element of the data structure, or manipulate one's location in it? Or how to construct a derivative of a type? In this video, we'll be discussing the algebra of algebraic data types, and a technique that targets arbitrary traversal of a data structure. Such data types are known as the zippers. We will begin our discussion with the definition of the cardinality of a set. Two sets A and B are said to be equivalent or equinumerous if there exists a bijection between them. A bijection is a one-to-one -one correspondence. In other words, for every element in the set B, there exists a unique element from the set A that gets mapped to it, and vice versa. Equinumerosity is usually denoted with a single tilde or a double tilde. This relation we've just described is an equivalence relation. Indeed, reflexivity holds because the identity function is an equivalence. Symmetry holds because for every bijective function f from a to b, there exists its inverse from b to a that is also a bijection. And lastly, transitivity holds because for every two bijective functions f from a to b and g from b to c, its composition g after f uh, from a to c is also a bijection. Then we define cardinality as the equivalence class for the equinumerosity relation. And it can be interpreted as a measure of a set's size. The cardinality of a finite set is precisely the number of elements in it. We can reason about the definition of cardinality of algebraic data types in a, a kind of similar manner. The cardinality of an algebraic data type is the number of all the valid terms of that type. Consider the following examples. Here are the four classic data types, void, unit, bool, and ordering. The cardinality of void is zero. Void, by definition, doesn't have any constructors. It's uninhabited. Unit has only one constructor, therefore its cardinality is one. Similarly for, likewise for bool and ordering, their cardinalities are two and three respectively. The interesting part comes when we remind ourselves that the data types can be parameterized. Now, instead of wrapping the type constructor with card, we will come up with an alternative nomenclature. Consider the identity type. It accepts a type parameter, say, A. As a matter of fact, its cardinality depends on that type parameter, since it appears to the right of the equals sign. More specifically, in its only data constructor identity that accepts a term of that type. So in this case, the cardinality kind of acts like a function that accepts a collection of type parameters listed after the declaration of the type constructor and returns some mathematical expression. Let's use the following notation. We write our type constructor. Then in parentheses, we list the type parameters. And after the equal sign, we specify the mathematical expression denoting the appropriate cardinality of the type in question. We can treat these expressions as kind of mathematical representations of those types. Our next example is a pair. It accepts two type parameters and represents the basic case of a product type. Its cardinality is equal to the product of the cardinalities of types A and B. Suppose we want to find the cardinality of the type pair ordering bool. Then we simply substitute the cardinalities of ordering and bool into our formula and we get 3 times 2, which is 6. Indeed, there are only 6 values of the type pair ordering bool. Likewise, the cardinality of either A, B is the sum of cardinalities of A and B, since either represents the basic case of a sum type. Here are two more examples. Consider our beloved maybe data type. If we construct it with the just data constructor, its cardinality will depend on the cardinality of the type parameter A. Nothing is a nullary constructor, and there's only one way to construct the term of the type maybe A with nothing, and it is just a pass nothing. That's it. Therefore, the cardinality of the type maybe A, since it's a sum type, is A plus 1. We will finish off with the cardinality of the function type. It is equal to the cardinality of b, representing the return type, raised to the power of the cardinality of a, which is the type of the argument. It is in direct correlation with the set theoretic notation of, of the set of functions from a to b. Suppose b is bool, then the cardinality of a arrow bool is the cardinality of the power set of a, which is 2 to the power a. Moving on to type isomorphism. Two types are isomorphic if there exists a bijection between them. This implies that the cardinalities of those types, their mathematical representations, have to be equal. 
And this statement can be proven by contradiction. Let's recall that a function is bijective if and only if it is first surjective, meaning for every element in the target set there exists an element in the domain that gets mapped to it, and injective, meaning that different values get mapped to different results. So given that the cardinalities of the domain S at the target T differ, we need to prove that the function or map is not bijective. In other words, either not surjective or not injective. First of all, suppose the cardinality of S is less than the cardinality of T. That means there exists at least one term of the type T, we call it Q, that does not belong to the image of F. In other words, for every argument P in the domain S, F of P is not equal to Q. Therefore, the map from S to T is not a surjection, and that means it's not a bijection either. Now, suppose the cardinality of S is greater than the cardinality of T. This yields the existence of at least two different arguments, S1 and S2, both of the type S, such that f of S1 is equal to f of S2. This means that the map from S to T is not an injection, and therefore not a bijection. Thus, finishing off this proof, let's look at a couple of examples of isomorphic types. A pair of pool and A is isomorphic to either AA. Both their cardinalities are equal to 2 times A, and we can manually construct a bijection. Maybe unit is isomorphic to bool. Both our cardinalities are equal to 2. Our bijection sends just unit to false and nothing to true. Now let's consider a recursive algebraic data type and calculate its cardinality. As we know, a list of A can either be constructed with the empty list constructor or with the cons constructor that accepts two terms, one of the type A and the other of list of A. This means its cardinality list of A is defined as 1 plus A times list of A. After substituting list of A on the right hand side with the entire right hand side ad infinitum, we get 1 plus A plus A squared plus A cubed and so on. This is the geometric series that has a closed form, 1 over 1 minus A. Of course it converges if the absolute value of A is less than 1 and there's only one data type that satisfies this inequality and that's void. Indeed, there exists only one way to construct a list of voids, and that's by passing the empty list constructor. If we instead substitute, say, unit for the type parameter a, there will of course exist an infinite number of elements of the type list of units. Speaking of the list of units, here's the final example of two isomorphic types, list of units and the piano naturals. Both our cardinalities are equal to aleph null, and we can indeed construct a bijection between them. Moving on, suppose we're interested in the type parameter A and its occurrence on the right-hand side of some type T. In other words, the definition of that type. Let's perform the following algorithm. First of all, we'll replace these occurrences with holes, where the data of the type A could go. There, of course, may exist more than one value of the type A in the constructor, and therefore more than one hole per constructor. Second of all, we'll remove the holes. This will alter the signatures of the constructors, and therefore alter the mathematical representation of the data type. And finally, we'll combine all the altered constructors into a single sum type. We're going to go through a multitude of examples to see what data types and their mathematical expressions we get. First of all, the double data type, which encapsulates a pair of two values of the type A. Its mathematical representation is A squared. We insert two holes, one at a time, in the data constructor D. After removing the holes, we're left with two unary data constructors, each wrapping a value of the type A. Now imagine we create a new data type with those new data constructors, let's call it double prime. Then its mathematical representation, written in the rightmost cell, is 2 times A. The triple data type is like double, except it encapsulates three values of the type A. By exactly the same reasoning, after removing the holes, we get three data constructors each holding the two values of the type A. And the new data type's mathematical representation is 3A squared. So far the new expressions look like the derivatives of the original ones. Spoiler, they are. Now, let's explicitly state that we focus on the type parameter A. This is necessary because our next example, pair, introduces another type parameter. We insert the only hole in the data constructor, then remove it, and we're left with P2, which accepts B. So the new math expression is B. The examples from this slide 
are similar to the ones from the previous slide, except here we're working with the sum types. Choice 2 is a sum type with two constructors. Each accepts a value of the type A. For every constructor, we substitute a hole for A. After removing the holes, we're left with two nullary constructors, collectively representing a math expression 2. Likewise for choice 3, except there's one more constructor to consider, the resulting math expression is 3. Moving on to either. The left data constructor holds a value of the type A, so we insert a hole. However, right holds a value of the type B and nothing else. A is nowhere present here, so we don't even consider this case. In general, for some types, if the constructor doesn't accept a value of the type A anywhere in its signature, we cannot place any holes and the entire constructor is skipped. In the end, we get a math expression 1. Ordering has three nullary constructors, the type variable A is not present anywhere, so we get 0. By the way, we could have introduced a formal bound variable and could have written ordering of A, but in this case it doesn't matter, the original math expression is a constant. Finishing off with the pair of ethers. Its math expression is A plus B quantity squared. Since we're operating a pair of ethers, we can either have two lefts, a left and a right, a right and a left, and two rights. First of all, we discard the last case where we have two rights, since both contain the values of the type B, therefore no holes to place. Then we have one left and one right, doesn't matter in which positions. We place one hole in the left for each of the two cases. Lastly, in the case of two lefts, there's only one hole to place for each left. As a result, after removing the holes, our new data type is represented by the expression 2 times A plus B. At last, let's define what a derivative of a type is. The derivative of a data type is the sum of terms corresponding to each one whole context for a type parameter in the expression. In other words, it can describe the information needed to know the location in the structure, to be able to move from one substructure to another with respect to the definition of the structure itself. However, given the nature of the definition of a derivative, it is missing the focused element in the given location. Well, no problem then. Let's combine the derivative of a data type with the type of the focused element into a product type. This is the definition of a zipper. We will briefly look at three examples of zippers. The homogeneous pair zipper, the list zipper, and the binary tree zipper. Earlier in the lecture, we've introduced the double data type, not to be confused with the type of the 64-bit floating point numbers. It represents the homogeneous pair where the two values are of the same type. Recall that its mathematical representation is a squared, which means the zipper's representation is a times the derivative of a squared, which is a times 2 times a, which is 2a squared, which is the same as a squared plus a squared. We express it like this to illustrate a more understandable definition of a double zipper as a sum type. We can think of this pair as a spatially oriented graph with two vertices and one edge. Each of the constructor's names represents the location of the focused element, and both constructors have the same selectors. Now, it is a pretty boring type, but let's play with it a little still. The function switch focus switches our focus to the other element. It doesn't change the order of the values because of these selectors. Refresh duplicates the focused value to the neighboring element. Alter updates the focused element with a binary operation whose first argument is a focused element, and the second argument, the neighbor. In the example to the right, we have a pair of 3 and 7. We're focused on the 3. We subtract 7 from 3 to get negative 4 and then overwrite the 3 with it. After that, we switch our attention to the right element 7. Then we replace 7 with 7 times negative 4 or negative 28. Lastly, before retrieving the values of the neighbor, we replace it with the focused value. In the end, we get negative 28. A more interesting example comes with lists. Recall that it's closed form or a generating function is 1 over 1 minus a. The list zipper is a times the derivative of 1 over 1 minus a, which is the same as a times 1 over 1 minus a squared, and after rearranging the terms we get two lists and a focus value. This data type represents a location in the list, where the first list is a collection of the elements to the left of the focused element, and likewise for the right list. Notice how both lists can be infinite. In this case, we can think of the list zipper as some sort of Turing tape. We can move left and right in our tape, so long as there's space to move. We can modify every element in the zipper since it is possible to define a functor instance. We can convert a non-empty list to a list zipper, focusing on the first element. 
What's great about the reverse function is this time complexity being constant. Implode is a function that performs a sort of fold of our zipper. As long as there are elements neighboring the focused one, we take them out and put them into a ternary function along with uh, the current focused element to get the new one, uh, symmetrically reducing the length of the zipper. Notice that this function holds if and only if one of the lists is finite. Generate is a function that generates an infinite zipper, given an initial value, which takes on the role of the focused element in a function. Be careful not to implode such generated zippers, otherwise you'll loop forever. Finishing off this lecture with the binary tree zipper. A binary tree can either be an empty node, aka leaf, or a node with an element and two children. Instead of solving for bin of A and binding the closed form and then taking the derivative of that, let's immediately take the derivative of this implicit equation. Bin prime of A is equal to bin of A squared plus 2A times bin of A times bin prime of A. Now solving for bin prime of A, we get bin of A squared over 1 minus 2 times A times bin of A. Notice uh, the 1 over 1 minus something sub-expression. This is the same as list of something. In our case, that something is 2 times A times bin of A. Multiplying this entire expression by A yields the binary tree zipper. This data type represents the location in the binary tree. We focus on an element in the node, and that node has two subtrees. However, we also have a way to go up. From the structure of the binary tree, we know that the focus node is either the left child or the right child of the parent node. If we are the left child, then to be able to go up, we need the information about our parent node as well as the right sibling, and vice versa. The up data type encodes exactly that logic. And provided the list of ups in the zipper, we can go up the tree until the list is empty. To better understand the movement through our structure, let's look at some of the functions. Go left is a function that moves our focus to the left subtree, if it exists, and stores the information of the current focused value and the right subtree in the right child constructor, prepending it to the list of ups. Likewise for go right. Goes to the right subtree if possible, stores the left subtree and the focused value in the left child constructor. Go up moves our current focus to the parent node, if it exists. Its existence is dependent on whether the list of ups is empty or not. Suppose it's not empty and its head is a left child. This means our focus node is the right child of the parent, and we perform the action exactly inverse to go right. Similar logic goes in the case for the right child constructor. In summary, we define the notion of cardinality of data types, similar to how they are defined for sets. A little bit of trivia. Type theory emerged as an instrument to avoid the paradoxes introduced by naive set theory. Of course, both share similarities. For example, we have the sets, the elements, and the epsilon operator acting as a binary relation between the two, and is called the membership operator. In type theory, we have types, terms, and to say that a term is of some type, we connect the two with the colon. But of course, type theory and set theory more specifically the zarmelo frankel set theory, do have their differences. For example, a term usually belongs to exactly one type, whereas an element can belong to a number of sets. Type theories have rules, but don't have axioms. Type theories introduce proofs as mathematical objects. Unless we provide the term of the type, say, 1 plus 1 equals 2, that type cannot be used, and so on. A data type can be expressed by its mathematical representation. Some types translate to addition, the product types translate to multiplication, Nullary reconstructors translate to the number 1, type parameters become formal bound variables, and higher kinded types become higher ordered functions. Consider the baby transformer. It accepts a type parameter m that, in turn, can accept a type. In this math expression, maybe t accepts a variable m, which is a function. Types have derivatives. A derivative of a type is another type that describes the location in the structure defined by its original type. Derivatives are missing the focused element. So we introduce it back in the definition of a zipper. By utilizing data isomorphism, we are able to express the logic of different zippers in a graspable way. Recall that two data types are isomorphic if and only if their mathematical expressions are equal. Thanks for watching! If you happen to have gained something useful out of this video, consider giving it a thumbs up, share your thoughts in the comments section, and if you'd like to see more videos like this, consider subscribing to the channel. Take care.